going to get right at it here with J.J. Reddick. No pleasantries. Uh, he is no longer an up-and-comer in the business. He is doing giant things in the media, Stugatz. I have told you. I wonder what his opinion is on what I'm about to say here. I have said a couple of times in the last month, J.J., that you're going to make more money in your media career than you did in your playing career. Am I wrong? Huh. That's an interesting take. Hadn't really thought about that. Um I don't know, Dan. I don't know. I, I, How much money is in your bank account yeah. right now? Tell That's, us. That is How not, rich yeah, are you? That yeah, is not yeah. what I was asking him. <laughs> I am just saying he's going to have 20, 25 years to do this, and if he continues conquering at the rate that he's doing it, he's made some very interesting and good choices on what it is that he wants to do. So let me talk to you a little bit about the options you had. Did you turn down an NBA coaching head coaching job? Not a head coaching job, no. I, I interviewed last year for the Raptors head coaching job. I was not offered the the, the opportunity to coach that franchise. Um, there was uh, a number of uh, assistant coaching opportunities, particularly my first sort of year and a half of retirement that were presented to me. Um, had conversations with different uh, head coaches about, about doing that sort of thing. Um, didn't, you know, life is about timing. That's why, Dan... To answer your question, I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. Um, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm motivated by the enjoyment and fulfillment of doing something. So for me, I really wanted to call games, and once I started calling games, I said, "Oh, I really like this. I would love to call the finals someday." Did not think it would happen in such a short amount of time, and obviously, there was a bunch of circumstances that led to getting uh, bumped to the to the A team with Mike and Doris. But I get to I get to call the Eastern Conference Finals and the NBA Finals this year. Like that's my motivation. Um, same thing as a player. Like I I wanted to be really good at my I wanted to be great at my craft. I probably settled on really good. I didn't get to quite to great. So it's the same thing here. I I, I want to be great at what I do. I want to enjoy it, and I want to do it with people that I enjoy working with. And so far, it's been wonderful. He made over $116 million in his NBA A lot of pocket career. watchers over at the Dan Levitard show. A lot of pocket watchers. No, I don't well, we don't you. have any. So. I don't blame you for not caring. You made 116 already. I, mean. <laughs> um, I am interested in the choices that you're making, though, because you have all of them available to you. What is the most fun? Oh, great question. I would... I would honestly say this, everything I get to do, I enjoy. Um, there were some things uh, early on, my first year I signed a one-year deal, there were some things that I, I, I can't say I enjoyed it, I did it um, because I was contracted to do it, but there were some things like, I, I've been on NBA Today in person, I think three times total. Twice my first year in L.A., once this year in Vegas for the in-season tournament. I really enjoyed that. When I did NBA Today from the New York studio, you're in a closet for an hour uh, with a camera on you and a screen in front of you. And it's it's a very small room, and you just sit in there with no cell service, and, and you don't get more than 10 to 15 seconds at a time. And I'm sitting over there, and I'm like, I'm jealous of the people that are in studio getting to do this, right? So everything I've chosen to do at this point whether that's been first take the podcast the new podcast mind the game with lebron uh the DraftKings uh segments that we do on our youtube channel and and obviously calling games i enjoy all of it i would say the best thing for me truthfully is calling games there's there's nothing like it um because you do get that closeness to the game and you also get a little bit of that performance anxiety that you had as a player um, you know, right before you, you do the live intro and then right before as they're doing the national anthem and the starting lineup and the producers in your ear, 90 to 90, you know, 90 to tease, whatever it may be, that feeling is something that is hard to replicate and, and probably isn't at the same level as when I played basketball, but I feel that performance anxiety when I get to call a game and, and that's really fun. Whenever I talk to people who uh, were lopsided because they obsessively did something like craft being great at three-pointers and they lose their identity because they have to grieve or mourn uh, retirement and the fact that they're burying who they used to be, 
almost every athlete I've ever encountered, and some are better equipped than others, fails with that transition initially just because it's so hard. You don't seem to have, but did you struggle with retirement? Dan, I know you like humor on your show, but if you'll bear with me, I'd like to tell a brief story. Um, so going into my last season, uh, unfortunately, coincided with uh, the COVID year. So I spent six weeks in the bubble. My son was starting kindergarten in New York, and I knew that entire fall that this was going to be my last year. And we play a game in Tampa, first game of the season, December 23rd. I play well. We go to Miami for our Christmas Day. We got the noon Christmas Day game. And my wife sends me a video that morning. I wake up to a video of Kai, my youngest, running down the stairs to the Christmas tree. And it was at that moment that I let go. I, I like Doc Rivers always talks about like, you know, this internal battle that we face as 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 players within a game. And and we certainly face that a little bit as we get towards the end of our career. You can't let go of the rope. You're in this tug of war. You can't let go. And at that moment, I let go. So I, I really struggled that entire season. My parents called me on New Year's. They said that we've watched the last four or five games. You don't look like yourself. I wept to my mother. I just want to go home. She said to me, well, why, why can't you? And I said, because I can't let go. And it's exactly what you're talking about. I didn't want to let go of that part of my ego. I didn't want to let go of that part of my identity. And that entire season, I Dan, I can remember games from high school. I can remember games from college. I can remember a random Wednesday night in Washington when I played for Orlando. I don't remember anything that last year. If you said to me, uh, you know, you played the Chicago Bulls when you played for the Pelicans your last season, what happened in that game? Did I play the Chicago Bulls? I don't remember. I don't, I don't know who I played that year. I just completely zoned out. And it took a couple months with my performance coach slash therapist to get to the point where I could let go of that part of me. It was the most confusing and scary thing. You brought up the word death. And I think any person that has competed in athletics, whether it's been high school, college, professional sports, Olympic sports, when you get to that moment, it is like a death. And it is a grieving process. And I was very fortunate. I would say I was fortunate and lucky in some ways, just due to timing, because I was one of the first guys that had started this player podcast revolution. I had a podcast. I was already going to be doing that podcast. I had one year left on my deal with, with Cadence at the time. And I, I got asked by Dave Roberts and my agent. They, they really pitched me hard on doing a year contract with ESPN. It gave me something to do. It gave me a sense of purpose beyond just being it. I remember there were days that first year where I wasn't very busy with ESPN yet, and I was only doing one podcast a week, and I'd have like a Thursday, Friday, and my kids are in school, and my wife's doing all the stuff that my wife does during the daytime. I'm sitting there at home. It's 12 degrees outside in New York City. What am I doing? Right? So I th this part of the athlete life cycle is incredibly diff difficult. And I, I, would, I would pose this to anyone who has played any level of, of sport or athletic. When it ended for you, were you sad? Did you grieve? Was it a hard transition? When you got done with your last high school event or your last college event, or maybe you played overseas, or maybe you played on the Corn Ferry Tour for a couple of years, was that a difficult transition? And I would say the vast majority of people would say yes. Now imagine dedicating your life, 30 years of my life, to one thing. LeBron talked about it on the Mind the Game. You have to sacrifice loved ones. It was such a selfish pursuit. And I was all invested at all times. And then that ends. Of course it's difficult. And it was very difficult for me, despite the fact that I had other stuff going on. He mentioned Mind the Game, uh, new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube and wherever it is you get your podcasts. What did your parents see? 
What did my parents see? Those last few games are those games where they could tell watching you on television that what are the you? The parents know the look. The, man. The, well, but you're what? Yeah. You're, what are you doing? What you are they noticing? I, you know what's funny? They weren't the only ones that saw it. Hmm. There's a I I, t- I took great pride in a player, and when I ask coaches or I ask GMs about certain guys, one of the things I always want to know is are they the same person every day? Do they come to the facility and they say hi to people? Do they talk to the trainers? Do they interact with the assistant coaches? Are they in the weight room talking to their teammates, talking to the performance staff? When they get to the arena, are they saying hi to the arena people? Uh, are they saying hello to the, the PA announcer? Are they going over and saying hi to Reggie Miller if it's a TNT game? Are they the same person every day? I stopped being that person. And it was clear in my body language. It was clear in my facial expressions. And they weren't the only ones. Josh Tiven, playing the Boston Celtics that year, Josh Tiven came up to me before a game, and he said to me, hey, man, you don't look like yourself. Is everything okay? And I didn't know how to respond to that. I was nine minutes away from competition. <laughs> and so I went back in the locker room and, and cried a little bit. I come back out. <clears throat> I was a little ornery that day. And uh, Josh gave me a technical. Uh, for yapping or something because I thought Aaron Neesmith fouled me. And then the very next possession, uh, I spun the ball a little too aggressively at him and he tossed me out. And it's a very like infamous moment in my career where I just, you know, I got thrown out for to- tossing the ball back to the referee. Uh, there's a backstory to why I threw the ball. I didn't actually mean to throw the ball at him. I didn't think, I thought, I thought the guy closest to the scores table was making the call to the scores table. It actually ended up being Josh who was down there, and I was trying to spin it around Tristan. I put a little too much English on it. We, him and I have worked it out, but it, that's what I mean by what my parents saw and what what Josh saw as well. And I'm sure, you know, Darnell, our assistant coach in New Orleans, he would talk to me at, sh- you know, pregame shoot around or at walk through in the morning. He's like, what the hell is going on with you, man? This wasn't the guy that was here last year. This is hard, man. It was hard. We have players like Kevin Love in the league embracing fixing your mental health. Where do you think we are right now in the league when it comes to mental health? I think we're in a much better place than we were when I first started in the NBA. I think the fact that guys like DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, um, coaches, um, everybody's just more open about it. And it's talked about in public forums. Um, you know, we, we, I've I've had chats with young players even in retirement cuz I'm I'm always available for guys if they need something you know are are you talking to anybody I know you're dealing with this issue are you talking to anybody and it it's no longer a taboo thing to be like hey guess what I'm in a little bit of a high pressure situation this is the thing that always annoys me it it annoys me when we do the discourse thing and Dan, I know you've gotten on me because you're like, you choose to be on first take and you make fun of it. And I'm like, that's fine, dude. I recognize what first take is. I recognize what this whole ecosystem is, and I have no problem with it. Whoa, 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 it's whoa, whoa. fun and entertaining. Who, well, who's, who's gotten on you? Who's gotten well, on you? I like what you do. I like how disruptive pe- pe- people you are on, on first people take. People on your show. I don't like how you treat people Mad Dog. He's an idol show. to me. That's all. That's all. I'm just saying, I, and you're not, you're, this show is not the only one that's ever pointed out the, the hypocrisy of it. I'm totally comfortable comfortable with with that my, my my point though is like the idea of who is under more pressure it is the stupidest fucking question and excuse my language we are all under pressure at all times that is the nature of a highly competitive highly cutthroat 450 jobs eight eight man rotation that's 240 basketball players in the world that get to play in the NBA on a consistent basis there is always pressure and it carries there is a cloud that is on you every single day of the NBA season it is not to the off season that you don't feel that there is a weight on you so that's the that's the pressure that exists in our sport so The fact that guys are now seeking out just someone to chat with, a a trained mental health professional, I think is wonderful. And and I give credit to DeMar specifically and and Kevin as as well for for leading this group of players, this generation of players, 
into recognizing that it's okay. It's okay. UConn Purdue tonight, 920, way too late. Who has more pressure? (laughs) <laughs> I was hoping you'd do a spit take there. I was hoping you were going to spit take there. I got him as he was drinking. Did, you, yeah, you, got, you almost great. got him. Um, That's great. I, I, That's enjoy, great. Answer, I enjoy what it is that you do on first take. Uh, I enjoy how disruptive you are. I enjoy how smart you are. And when it comes to questions like that, most pressure, I enjoy that uh, Shannon Sharp has to say to you, will you pre- please embrace the hypothetical? We can't do a show and you're like they tried to voice this on me in the pre-production meeting and I didn't want to talk about it there either I like that you pull back the curtain on all of that stuff and I like what you're doing in general in the media but I want to circle back around to what you were saying about your son letting go and the Christmas tree can you tell me what was happening there can you take us back to that moment and how it is that you were able to let go yeah uh so, you know, he's, geez, this was uh, 2020, so he had just turned four. He was about four and a half years old. And you, we, anybody who's had kids knows the joy that a four and a half year old has on Christmas morning. And so he, he runs down the stairs of our apartment and he, he sees the Christmas tree all lit up and all the presents that Santa has brought. And it was just, it was hard because... I didn't get to experience that moment with him. And again, that was also, I I think it was harder because I had played on the road before on Christmas. I think I played 12 of the 15 years in the NBA. I think I had a Christmas day game. Sometimes my family would come, sometimes they wouldn't. But what was hard about that was I had had missed six weeks with them. It was closer to eight weeks, actually, because I had to go to New Orleans early to report to market. So I'd missed maybe eight weeks that prior summer. And, and, you know, like the off season, if you have a family in, in professional sports, whether you're a coach or a player, like the off season is like the bread and butter. That's like the sweet spot. That's why you do it. So you get the real time with your family. And I had missed out on that. And then just, it was like, for some reason, it was that moment of seeing the joy on his face that I said, oh, I can't do this anymore. I've what? missed too much. When you talk about things that annoy you, and there are many because you articulate them all the time, what annoys you most about the way basketball is covered by the mainstream media? Um, again, I, 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 I want to be fair here. People, people watch discourse shows. The discourse shows go viral. Um, there are funny moments. There are entertaining moments. I think Stephen A., I've worked alongside him for almost three years now. He's one of the smartest people I've been around. He really, truly is. And you can disagree with it was, with some things that he does or whatever, but I've genuinely enjoyed it. I I, I think what annoys me is that the game gets lost, that the things that I grew up watching and the things I grew up being talked about, that has been lost. And it's it's nearly almost universally specific to basketball. And it's really interesting. I'm sure you guys are going to talk about this, and I'm sure you followed along. It's really interesting what has happened over the last two weeks in women's college basketball. We have witnessed some of the best performances in recent memory. We certainly, I'm not going to get into the GOAT debate at all, but Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, Don Staley as a coach, like we're in real time witnessing some of the best basketball players and coaches in that sport. In all, in all, in all of basketball, I should say. I'll, I'll be fair. In all of basketball, and we've spent two weeks on the. That's what annoys me. Mind the game. New episodes every Wednesday on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I imagine is the zig to that zag, right? When you complain about people don't want to be educated, I'm guessing that you, as someone who appreciates the roots 
of basketball, I'm guessing that you being across from LeBron James are simply awed by being able to pick that mind. I've always had a, a deep appreciation for LeBron and the mental side of his game. And obviously I competed against him. Uh, you know, I, I didn't play a lot in 2009 in the conference finals, but you know, I'm sitting there on the bench watching what he's able to do. 38 points a game, eight rebounds, eight assists with zero spacing. And I'm like, that guy's, he's different. He's different in the same way that I watched Kobe Bryant. Uh, he, he was different, you know, and I, I've had a Luca's the same way. Jokic is the same way. James Harden is the same. Like these guys think the game and they court map the game at a different level. And there are certain coaches now that I get to interview before games that yeah, you, you ask them a couple questions and you're like, okay, these guys think about this differently. And there's a lot of joy that I get out of that. And it's a, and an incredible opportunity. Not ju I don't look at it as like an opportunity for me. This is an opportunity for any basketball fan to listen to one of the greatest players ever talk about the game of basketball. We saw that um, for a few years with Kobe. And God rest his soul, I think him being gone, there's a void there. Like how many of the all-time greats are talking about the game? I, I, I don't know if there's anybody. I, I just don't know. And so it's an opportunity for fans to, to get an inside glimpse at how the game works, the why. I never forget the, when I first signed up to do ESPN, somebody asked me, what, what do you hope to do? And I didn't know what the landscape was. I, didn't, I truthfully did not know First Take was a debate show. I'm being honest with you. I did not know that. And I was like, I want to help explain the why. Like, I want to help explain the why. Why, why. why are you putting two on the ball against Steph Curry? Why is Draymond catching the ball with no one in the middle of the, of the court and he's got a four on three? Why are they back cutting out of the corner and Draymond's hitting Iguodala or Andrew Wiggins on a lob pass for a dunk? Why is that happening? It's a great pass. It's a great cut. It's a great finish. It's beautiful to watch, but why? And that's essentially what this show is. There's there's a there's a level of of why things happen the way they do. JJ, did LeBron finish the sentence? Do you want to host a podcast with me? Before you said yes, like was he able to finish that sentence, or you just said yes when he called? <sighs> well, how do how do you know that he called me? I don't. Yeah. See, huh. so you're making assumptions here, right? You're making assumptions. That's interesting. But had he called you, <laughs> JJ. to throw away all the journalistic credibility and get reckless. Here is something we like to call reckless speculation. You're good. You're good to answer that now, JJ. <laughs> oh, man. Um, look, I, 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 you know, we, we, we met uh, in December. A um, group of us met just to have a sort of initial conversation. And. I think it was trying to figure out the biggest thing was just trying to figure out what the show was, what it would look like, um, what the format would be. We went through different iterations of it. Um, you know, I, I think it wasn't about like, uh, yes, 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 I'll do it. It was like, all right, let's figure out how to make this work. I mean, even now it's like I, I'm flown to L.A. twice to record these episodes in person. I, I live in New York City, man. It's like trying to figure out how to make it all work. It's not like a, a seamless thing. He's he's an active player trying to <laughs> get into the playoffs and, and make another run. So the logistical stuff of it uh, has been, uh, you know, interesting to try to figure out. Got a couple of rapid-fire questions here before we let you go. Mind the Game, new episodes every Wednesday. Do you believe that your podcast partner, LeBron James, flu-like symptoms that he uh, missed last night's game because he wants Minnesota to be the number one seed so he can face them in the playoffs instead of Denver? <laughs> <laughs> I have no reason to believe that's the case. <laughs> I, other, than, oh, other than Jokic, like, why would anybody want to play against you? <laughs> why would anybody, never mind the oldest player in the league, why would anybody want to be playing against Jokic? You know, it's a, I, there's, there, there are different points in time in my career where teams would do that, 
and I'm not saying the Lakers are doing that at all because they're again they, they haven't secured a playoff spot yet. And I'm sure you know for them, wouldn't it be nice to 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 win the seven eight game and not have to play in an eight nine single elimination elimination game? So I don't I don't I don't think that's happening. But the there were times in my career where teams would do that, and there were a few times where it came back to bite them. So just be careful what you wish for in a matchup. We've played this game before with you. I'm going to play it again. Shot for your life, okay? Shot has to go in. You can only choose He one. understands what shot for your life I'm is. I'm just making yeah. sure, trying to clarify for the audience, He's one of Dan. the smartest uh, players in I'm the well history aware. of the league. Yes. Complicated game. Yep. But shot for your life, JJ. Okay, here are your choices. Yourself or Caitlin Clark? JJ or CC? Wow. Mm-hmm. I think last last time I was on the show, you asked me, me or Larry Bird? Yes. And, yeah. I, and I, I answered me, and I'll answer me <laughs> And again. I can't believe you're still here. Yes. I mean. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to say me again. I'm, I'm not putting this. I don't want my my life in the hands of someone else. Okay. I will trust the, the probably close what? to a million shots that I've shot in my life. Uh, I walk on a basketball court right now. I'm I'm give me 25 shots, five shots at each spot. I'm making 20. I'm making 20. Uh, I got an 80 percent chance of being alive. Last question. (laughs) True or false. It's done for the old people. Uh, The young people will be the ones who win the championship this year in the NBA. True or false. Oh, interesting. Um, and who, I, I need some delineation here of who are the old people and who are the under young people. 30. It's not going to be Kawhi. It's not going to be the guys who have run oh, the league, oh, run the, run the league not forever. Durant, not LeBron. Not, not not LeBron. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I will say the young people, young people. I will tell you again that JJ Reddick is making very good choices with his media career, and it is going to be a wildly fulfilling one for him. Dan, since he doesn't remember, JJ, I wanted to remind you your final game for the Pelicans 22 points, 9 of 15 shooting. It was on a Wednesday night. That's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, interesting. You don't remember? <laughs> you don't remember? <laughs> you don't. No, I, you know what? I you just. That, that sparked a thing in my brain, actually. <laughs> Garrett Temple. Who uh, who locked me up in the 2006 Sweet 16 when he played at LSU? Shout out to Garrett Temple, great dude, great pro. So happy he's had the career he's had. He guarded me that game, and I remember after the game he came up to me and said, "Hey, it's good to see you get your mojo back." And I always appreciated that. Uh, and I don't think I scored in double digits again. <laughs> uh, JJ, good seeing you. Thank you for making the time, sir. All right, thanks, guys.